Hey guys, so welcome to this video. I'm Brett Allegra Wood and I'm a Group Managing Director of Easy Track Property Group and also Gladfish Property. Um, author of over 25 books, I've been in property for over 25 years and what I wanted to do today was really just because it's a really tough time right now in terms for everyone from agents to landlords to, to, to tenants and, and the amazing thing is, is actually we're really seeing people come together you know, and people are really dealing with this you know, medical um, you know, issue you know, in a very humane and, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see how people respond to it. Now, now, sure, there's a number of people who are getting frustrated and getting angry and things like that. But, you know, that's to be expected in the circumstances. There's uncertainty in terms of people's health, their family, you know, they've got concerns about that. But what I want to do today was just sort of introduce to you the Homes Fit for Habitation Effectively legislation and the Landlord and Tenant Act and how it applies to maintenance. Because obviously... The, one of the challenges with the lockdown is that we're unable to do certain bits of, um, of uh, effectively maintenance. So, you know, despite you calling up or, you know, a tenant calling up and saying, get this done or this needs fixing, we can't actually go out and fix it in necessarily. It depends on the circumstance. So we're going to look at that today. And I want to just explain to you what the regulations are about, because what we're finding is a lot of people who don't really understand the regulations are starting to, you know, state what they see as facts about it. Um, and they're just they're deciding what is habitable and what's not habitable, and uh, you know it's creating a lot of um, frustration and and drama because that doesn't need to be there. You know, so we get that when things break, you know, want to fix. We get the maintenance you want them fixed. We all get that, and everyone gets that. But so I really want to explain that to you, so you've got a framework to work from, and obviously. You know, we all want the right, the same things. You know, we're good landlords who employ us as agents to look after the property and make sure that you can have quiet enjoyment. You know, um, but the proviso is you act like in a tenant-like manner. You know, these are all basic concepts, okay? And and look, homes fit for habitation. We're, we're going to go into the legislation. What I really want you to get out of this is the fact that there's two levels of legislation because you read the legislation, the act, and it straight off, you know, legislation.gov or whatever it is. It's not very friendly. It's not very friendly to read. But then they have their guidance, which actually is a lot more friendlier. And then you probably, to be fair, need someone who's been in the industry quite a while to explain what the hell a lot of these things mean and practically what they mean. Because this is one of the problems with legislation. Is it doesn't necessarily mean that it means anything. So let's get into it anyway. So who are we? Look, we're easy track. We're a true hybrid since 2009. You know, we've got a centralized office. Um, you know, and basically what we do is have local agents all around the country. So we have about 1,250 properties or a little more than that, um, and effectively we manage them centrally, okay? Um, so where that model has been working since 2009, you know, we've seen lots of other models come and go, lots of attempts on it, but this model works really well. You know, in terms of who I am, um, as I said, 25 years, I've written 25 books, I've got various property companies, properties in my blood, it's what I do. Um, I, but more importantly for this video, I've got my level three in Arla, for sales and my level three for property management, uh, lettings and management. So I've got both those. And I'm one subject away, which has just been delayed, unfortunately, um, from getting my level four in property management lettings. Okay, so lots of experience. You know, I'm pretty hands on day to day. I'm pretty involved with a lot of the decisions. I see what goes on. You know, um, I'm reading constantly about the industry and, and the changes that have been happening because there's been lots of them. Um, so yeah, but that's, so let's get into it anyway. Um, the homes fit for habitation. The interesting thing with homes fit for habitation is it actually doesn't place any more obligations on the landlords. What it does is it gives the tenants effectively a way to um, take it to court, effectively to, to sue a landlord if they aren't taking action. Okay, but there's prov some provisos on that. Okay, so if they're not meeting their responsibilities, then you can potentially take them to um, thing. And what it's meant to do is it's meant to get rid of these slum landlords and raise the standard. This is the thing the government's been doing for quite some time. Look, the ex exceptions are, and look, these are straight off the guidance, but bottom line is, if you're, if it's your behavior that caused it, or your um, possessions that caused it, or it's an act of God, um, then it's not really covered. Now, there's other things like planning and you know other stuff, don't worry about that. It also doesn't cover um, people who have licenses occupied. So if you invite a friend over, technically that's giving them a license, they have to be permitted occupiers or tenants that it will cover, all right? Um, but bottom line is, if you do something, that's still your responsibility. So what this is designed to do, it's not designed to change fundamentally anything about the Landlord and Tenant Act or the Housing Act. What it does is it adds a, a clear path with which to take if things are not being remedied, 
okay? Or, you know, um, remedy unfitness, if you like, okay? Uh, for habitation. But let's um, look, how long? Now, this is interesting because this is a lot of people think that you've got to be done right now, you know, it has to be done today, you know? No, it doesn't, okay? Landlords consider responsible from the time that you make them aware of it. Now, if it's a communal area and a H HMO and things like that, then it's assumed that they know what's going on, so they should be immediately aware of it, okay? But, you know, I'm sure there's some flexibility there in terms of when was actually told. But what I would say is, if you're reporting it through, for instance, our website at help.easytrack.co.uk, then fine. From that point on, obviously, we've got a record of that. But if you phone up and just say, this is the problem, and then hang up and then don't actually do anything about it, or, you know, it may not get through in terms of if you don't, you know, don't give full details or whatever, we don't know about it, or maybe we fix something else and, you know, so best to put it in writing so you've got that documentation. Um, and look, the landlord's got a reasonable time. Only the courts can decide what a reasonable time is, all right? So a lot of times it's, you know, the tenants are saying, hey, I want this done tomorrow, you know, otherwise I'm not paying rent or, you know, this is that or, you know, and it creates a lot of animosity because we're going to get things done as soon as possible. But getting people out there, getting the right parts and all this sort of stuff can take time, okay? So, you know, that's, everyone's got to be aware of that. If everyone's aware of it, look, we're there to get this stuff. We don't want outstanding maintenance issues, you know? That's not what it's about, okay? But bottom line is, and, and I think this is the important point here, is, you know, it's a reasonable time, yeah, to get it done. But the, the point at which you can actually take this to the next level in terms of court or whatever um, and actually you know instruct that side of it is actually when they stop um, progressing the actual thing all right so that's the important thing there you know it's um if they're not actively attempting it says here and it's not actively attempting to remedy the hazard yeah so if they're actively and they're keeping you up to date so that would mean they're keeping you up to date they might be speaking to the landlord they may have to go to get the decision depending on the price so as long as it's progressing all right and that's why what we do is we try and at least once a week keep you in the loop as what's happening. You know, if it's a longer term thing, if it's an easier thing, we'll instruct um, contractors straight away who will then contact you. That system works pretty well. And for the most part, we don't really have problems, okay? Um, what are the criteria now? Interestingly, this is the guidance from the Homes Fit for Habitation, okay? Boss, um, the courts will decide what's fit for habitation, not you or I, um, but obviously we've got a bit of experience in that. Build it, you know, here's the, the criteria. So buildings have been neglected or bad condition, they're unstable, serious damp, unsafe layout, not enough natural light, not enough ventilation, problem with supply of hot and cold water, and problems with drainage of lab, you know, in lavatories. So, oh, and, and, and inability to cook and prepare food. There's also 29 other hazards, but they're more like your gas safety certificates and things like that. I'm not gonna get into those, that's, that's a whole nother thing, but bottom, bottom line is you can go to the Housing Health and Safety England Regulations 2005, and that's there. And this is one of the things you'll realize is, you know, there is 170 pieces of legislation. They all sort of refer to each other and it's a mismatch, a mix, mismatch, it's not a mismatch. They all do come together, but it's so complex, okay? So we wouldn't expect you guys to know it. We don't even expect the landlords to know it most of the time. And that's one of the reasons why I've got my level three and doing my level four, because myself and my team, and I make my team all do the level three at least, you know, um, so we're all up with these 170 pieces of legislation because it does affect you and, you know, and your rights and the landlord and their rights, okay? So if you have a look here, this is the guidance note. Let's go to the Landlord and Tenant Act 2000, um, um, sorry, 85, 1985, Clause 10, all right, which is where those points come from. Repair, stability, freedom from dam, internal arrangement, natural lighting, ventilation, water supply, draining and sanitary conveniences and preparation of food, okay? So they're the same things. They're just written in a more English version um, than a sort of legalese here. And, and that's one of the things, when you read the Act, it can be a bit mind-blowing, all right? The Act also refers to Section 2, which is basically, where are we? Oh, so actually, that's Clause 10, and then there's Clause 11 too, which is about repairing obligations, okay? Don't worry too much about that right now, but just understand that if you're trying to read the Act, it's pretty hard. Go for one of the guidance notes. Section 2 of the Housing Act is basically letting of a dwelling house together with land, all right? Which basically says, you know, if, you're, if it's your own home and you're living in it, this act doesn't necessarily apply, okay? But if you're um, renting it out, it does apply. Okay, so let's talk a bit more. So working together, I mean, this is what we have to do, you know? The, the key thing is communication. If you tell us what's going on and what the problem is, you give as much details up front, it helps us solve the problem quickly, yeah? And there's got to be some understanding. Now, understand right now, if we're talking about, you know, lockdown and, and even any time when there's a crisis or anything like that, 
you know, where, for instance, um, contractors may be absolutely, you know, out, you know, too busy to keep things going and moving and that sort of stuff. This is, you know, this will happen. But bottom line is, look, if there's an emergency, it's always deal with the emergency first, then contact us later through help.easytrack.co.uk. And in there, you've got the, the after hours number and that sort of thing. But, um, but look, bottom line is right now, in terms of coronavirus and in a lot of emergency situations, not emergency, crisis situations where, you know, we may not be able to get contractors out and things like that, non-urgent stuff, you know, we're probably not likely to do it. So right now with coronavirus, non-urgent stuff we're not doing. We're in lockdown. Yeah, so we're following the government things and you know, stay at home, they're saying, so our team are already at home and they're working from home, the whole whole team, okay? We've been prepared, for, not for this, but for this type of thing for quite some time. So we've very easily moved into our work from home, although as a lot of you guys are finding out, working from home is not quite the same thing, there's not the same banter, but we're doing all things like 9.30, we do a, a, a call, 5.30 we've got emails, we do lunches together, you know, so there's a lot of good things happening right now. But unfortunately, if your blinds fall down, we can't come out and fix it. It's not considered to be an urgent or an emergency uh, thing. Um, but the other side of it is, and that's probably, let's say it's three weeks. It might be longer, but let's say three weeks. Even when we come back, day one, the contractors that are back, they're gonna to be totally swamped with the last three weeks work and the additional work now. So they're gonna have four weeks to work to do. So it's gonna take them a couple of weeks to get back. So we will get it done and we will get it, but you know you might have to hang ten with that for a bit, all right. Um, now look, urgent will still be done as soon as possible, all right. Now you've got to realise a lot of contractors are not working. A lot of contractors, we just had a contractor say they can't do any work because um, a number of their people are actually um, um, have got the virus, and then what they've done is got the virus and they've been working with other people, so they've actually quarantined everyone, you know, in the whole business. So that is that's like it happens. So then we're going to try and find somebody else who is also busy. So there's all these sort of issues we're dealing with. Okay, um, the trick is don't get angry. We're all frustrated. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. We're going to do the best. We still want to get this done for you. It's not like we're trying not to do it. Yeah. So look, work together and we'll get it done. But yeah, guys. So that's uh, all I want to get across today. Hopefully that helps you. You know, get a bit of understanding from where we're coming from. You know, we will still deal with emergency stuff. We've still got staff on. Um, they are working really, really hard. You know, they may not answer the phone straight away. They may not respond straight away, but we will get onto it. I mean, they're, they're, you know, the amount of volume of emails coming in and phone calls coming in has gone through the roof, okay? Because there's a lot of fear, misunderstanding, like lack of information out there. Hopefully that'll settle down once people sort of get a sense for where things are at. Um, but obviously, you know, guys, look, you know, any questions, you can send them through, you know, call the team, email the team. Um, but what I will say is this, you know, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, of course, stay at home. All right, guys, thanks very much. Have a great day, and uh, hopefully chat soon. Um, but be safe. See you guys, bye.